Я ем ее, господа. Я очень рада быть с вами вместе сегодня. Я извиняюсь. Много по-русски не говорю. Только несколько слов. Но русский язык очень люблю. Sorry for not being able to teach in Russian, um, but it's an honor to be here with you today. And um, I thank you for your interest in this topic of uh, profiting from technological innovation. A few words about myself, first of all. I'm a faculty member, a professor of strategy and innovation in London at Imperial College. Imperial College is the largest scientific and technological university in the United Kingdom. Um, do I speak too fast? No, it's, no, it's okay. So I'm originally a French um, citizen and I uh, worked as an engineer for a few years in defense industry and then I went to America and I studied at Stanford University and at MIT where I got a PhD in management of technological innovation doctorate. And I've been now an academic, business academic for over 10 years. The objective of today, and uh, you will be able to have a copy of these uh, slides if you ask uh, the organizer, because I gave them uh, the copy. You can, you can look at it on the blog as well. Are to clarify how to create value and how to capture value. And I will try to explain the difference between creating and capturing value in high-tech industries. We will try to explain how technological change, market dynamics, competition, and the evolution of demand from customers all play a role into these questions of creating and capturing value. The topics we will cover today in the three hours lecture we have how to create and capture value, how technological change affect markets, what do we mean by the industry life cycle, how to profit from innovation, and the interesting topic of how do you create a new market space when there is already too much competition in one existing market. So it's a lot to cover, and we have three hours. And what I would like to do is to have two breaks within the three hours, because nobody can pay attention for just solid three hours. So we'll, we'll talk for 40, 45 minutes, have a break, 10, 15 minutes, then another lecture, 40, 45 minutes, another break, and then uh, the last one. I would like to start with the fundamental question of business strategy. What do we mean by strategy? And it's important to think about innovation in a strategic context. Strategy is a pattern of decision or actions about how to allocate resources and capabilities. That is, if you work in a company, and if you are a manager or an executive in that company, your primary responsibility is to allocate the resources of the company correctly to the different activities of the firm. Are you going to spend 25% of the budget on research and development, or 15%, or 5%, or 50%? How much are you going to spend on marketing and advertising? Are you going to enter a new market in a new geography, or are you going to exit another market? Right. So those who own the corporation and trust the managers to make the right choices about how to allocate those resources. And strategy is a plan, is a way to allocate these resources to meet a particular goal or a set of goals. But these goals do not exist in the vacuum. As an organization, you operate within a given environment which is outside of your firm. The environment will be the industry, your competitors, but also your customers, also your suppliers, the legal environment, 
everything that's around the company that has an effect on the company. So that's the external side of strategy. That has to fit, to match, to be in co uh, conjunction with the internal resources and capabilities, such as the human resources, the financial resources, and the technological resources. So strategy is about allocating resources and capabilities in a given environment to achieve long-term goals. This approach emphasizes consistency, focus, commitment, and perseverance in actions. And it helps also speed up decision-making, coordinate, and focus people's actions. I want to spend some time on talking about value. What does the word value mean? People talk about value all the time. Okay? So let's assume that um, let's assume that what's your name, sir? Alexander. Alexander. Let's assume that you have a little bottle of water in front of you and that you are a salesperson. You want to sell the bottle of water to me. I'm walking on the road, and I see you, and I see the bottle of water that you're selling to me. Okay? The question we're going to try to understand is, under which circumstances will I decide to make the transaction with you, yes or no, to buy the bottle of water? Okay? So let's all think together, what will it depend on if I buy or if I don't buy the bottle of water now to Alexander? What could it depend on? What's your name, sir? Uh, Dima. Dima. Or Dimitri. Dimitri. Okay. Uh, the first of all, first of all is whether you need it or not. Yeah. Am I thirsty or am I not thirsty? Right? This may depend if I just had a bottle of water or an orange drink five minutes ago or whether I've been walking in the desert for three hours. Right? So the actual thirst is a function an input of that decision. What else? Another need. Another need. Another need? Yes. Not only third, maybe something else. Like what? I don't know. Just wash your hands when you need. Oh, I see. <laughs> so if I could use it for something else. Okay. So any need. Any. Okay. Yes. Good point. Yes. Anything else? What else does it depend on? Whether I will buy from Alexander or And Alexander, you can talk as well. It's maybe your budget. Exactly. How much money do I have in my pocket? Yes. Very good. What else? And there are also maybe an ice cream shop somewhere. Excellent. The competition. Alexander, are you the only one on that road with a bottle of water? Or are there 10 people next to you offering the same bottle of water? And then there will be the question of price. Are you selling it cheaper than everyone else, the same price, or more? So you see that for the very simple transaction of one individual buying a simple good, a bottle of water from another individual, there are already several variables that go into this decision. Okay? I'm using this example to make us think more about what does that mean to create and capture value. For Alexander to be able to come to the bottle of, with the bottle of water on his table, he had first to incur some costs. He had to buy this water for somewhere. He had to buy the little table to put the bottle on. Maybe he had to pay rent to have the right to use the space on the street. Or maybe there is a little store around it. So for Alexander to be able to create the possibility of a transaction, he had to, supply, to purchase some supply and incur some internal cost. So even before the transaction happens, some cost has already incurred. Then Alexander is going to think carefully about the price at which he is going to sell his water. Obviously, he wants to make some sort of margin, which is the value that will be captured by the firm, here represented by Alexander, if the transaction happens. If the price is too high, I will probably not buy it unless I'm extremely thirsty. If the price is too low, he will not re recuperate his cost and make enough margin to be able to buy more, uh, purchase more supplies to money. 
as far as I'm concerned, imagine that I'm happy with the price, I'm thirsty enough, and I buy the bottle from Alexander. I spend, let's say, half a ruble to buy this bottle. What value do I keep? Right? I'm poorer of half a ruble, but I have made an assessment that the value that I get out of buying this bottle is greater than the money that I spent. Otherwise, I wouldn't buy this book. So what's happened here is that in the context of a transaction, both Alexander and me are better off. We are in a better situation after the transaction happens than before the transaction happens. And that is really at the heart of all economic exchange and the value created by the business world around us which is that because value happens in the context of an exchange and that different people value things differently. I value that bottle of water at half a ruble, but Alexander, he paid for it, let's say, 20. So he would be happy if I, if for, for, uh, for half a ruble exchange, and I'm happy because to me it, it, it was worth more. So what we see here is that after the transaction, both parties are happy. There's value captured by the firm, value captured by the consumer, and that's the total value created. Okay? So that's a fundamental basis of all economic exchange. Now what happens in the context of technological innovation is many times the firms or the inventors of an innovation, they create a lot of value because without them this innovation would not have happened they are not always capable of capturing the returns on their innovation. Maybe because other firms are going to copy it and imitate it and say, that's a great idea. I did not have to invest all the time in research and the development and the failures associated with that uncertain and risky process. And now that Andre has come up with this idea, I'm going to go and copy it and make money out of it. And history is full of these examples. So if you want to think in a strategic way about technological innovation and design an effective strategy, you have to answer three questions. How will we create the value? First question. And for this, you have to understand how markets and technology interact. And we're going to spend some time describing that. Then, if we are not just one entrepreneur on its own, but a firm, how will we build the organizational capabilities necessary to deliver this value? And as important, if not more, how will we capture the value in the face of competition? You see that these are different questions, but each of them has to be answered, and each of them requires different kind of activities. So how will we create value, how will we capture value, and how will we deliver value? To think about how will we capture value, we have to ask ourselves how will the technology evolve, how will the market change? To answer the question of how will we capture value, welcome. We should have answer how should we design the business models, how should we compete, and where should we compete in the value chain? Do you know the meaning of the word value chain? So the value chain is when you have several firms who each uh, build one part of the product. And all together that creates value. Sometimes you can call it value chain, sometimes you can call it supply chain. And the last question is how will we deliver value? How do we manage the core business as well as growth? How do we use our strategy to drive resource allocation? Any, sorry, any questions so far on this? No? I want to tell you about a framework that I find very useful when you start thinking about technological innovation. This is um, a theory of technological change that has been developed 
uh, by uh, uh, two professors, one of, uh, at Harvard Business School and the other one at MIT, um, Utterback, Jim Utterback, who was one of my professors at MIT. And the professor at Harvard was called Abernathy. What they, uh, they, they studied a lot of different industries, from birth to death. Because when we are just looking at a, a very short period of time, we get the wrong impression that industries are here forever. But actually, industries sometimes have a beginning, and very often have a beginning. They grow, and then sometimes they end. And they go through a process which can be simplified by this model. It usually starts by innovation. An innovation that changes a lot of things about the way to propose a particular good. Or sometimes to offer a product or a usage that did not exist before. To give an example, I'm going to talk about the automotive industry. So over 100 years ago, the first automobiles were built. Do you know how the very first automobiles used to be called before they even were called automobiles? They used to call them horseless carriage. A carriage without a horse. Which made complete sense in a context where the vehicle, the normal vehicle to go from place A to place B was a carriage with a horse. And this was a carriage without a horse. And you define as human beings something new in, um, in reference to what you know. And if you go to a, a, an automobile museum and you look at the different kinds of vehicles that existed about 100 years ago, you would be struck by the big variety of designs of automobiles. Some were very, very long. And some were very small. Some were very high. Some used different kind of material, wood, glass, rubber, metal. Some were mostly made out of metal. The place where the engine was, was in different types of places. Lots of inventors all over the world got very excited about the idea of building those automobiles. And what you see is what the theorists called an era of ferment and discontinuity. Ferment like when you try to make bread, there is this fermentation or, or wine, this fermentation process, a lot of activity. And this translates into a lot of different types of designs. After a while, sometimes 10 years, sometimes 15 years, sometimes 20 years, Something called a dominant design starts to emerge. That is, the different types of automobiles gradually start to look like each other. People figure out that to have a good stable design for an automobile, you shouldn't have three wheels or six wheels, you should probably have four. There is a convergence on some aspects of, okay, this is what an automobile looks like. This is the right way to design a combustion engine. This is a way that works about how to make wheels. And if you look on the roads today, yes, there is some divergence between the designs of automobiles, but much less divergence than there was actually in the years ago. What happens together with the emergence of this dominant design is that a lot of the early entrepreneurs fail. Either they exit altogether, or sometimes they get bought up, or their idea and their product get bought up by other firms. And what happens is usually the emergence of a small number of players who start to become more and more powerful. That's what happened in the automobile industry with a period of consolidation. Consolidation means exit of lots of entrants and also a few entrants becoming bigger and bigger and buying out the rest. What you see here, at least in the automotive industry, but in many other manufacturing-based industries, is that perhaps the innovation on the design goes down a little, but those firms who remain invest a lot into automation and innovation on processes. 
how to make lots and lots and lots of those autos here. And in manufacturing heavy industry, what you see is that there's this concept of economies of scale, volume. You start to have a few companies that dominate the process of mass production. And they are reducing the cost per unit of their product. They are able, therefore, to have a cost advantage compared to other firms for which remain very costly to produce these products. And those economies of scale allow them to gain a competitive advantage. So what you see here is that you have perhaps less innovation on the designs of the product, but more innovation on the process of how to make the product. So you're getting into that phase here of consolidation, incremental innovation on the product itself, but more innovation on the processes. And finally, you get to a stage of maturity. And that's where the existing players are reaching demand that seems to be saturated. They start to ask, how can we continue making money here? And sometimes they start to invent new ways of making money. We start to add services, or we release the automobiles differently. We do a different way of market segmentation. So you get, you get to see business model innovation. This particular framework is helpful to understand the evolution of industry. If you think about the evolution of product combined with the evolution of technology, you can ask yourself, OK, imagine science and technology is helping to push the limits of what we can do. But performance is ultimately constrained by physical limits. If you take the design of a sailing ship, you can add different kinds of sails, and you can cut them differently. But ultimately, there's going to be something like the power of wind, which is going to act as a limit. If you're going to do semiconductors, at some point, you're going to reach the limit of the speed of the electron. Is that true? Is that not true? What do you think? Yep. It's true? Sure. Yes. Okay. But you can also say, OK, when you reach a particular limit, here, the speed of the electron, maybe you're going to start to look for new technologies like nanotechnology. Maybe you're going to try to think at a different level, a different aspect of the physics that will be able to reach new levels of performance. But firms usually specialize on one particular technology. They get very, very good at it. And then at some point, it reaches the limit. If you think about this curve, which has the shape of an S, you can try to position where we are in the S curve according to which industry you're looking at. If you think about the steel making industry, we are probably here. Countries like China are becoming excellent at producing steel. The technology of making steel has gone through a lot of innovation. It's not a young industry anymore. We are probably here. If you think about biotechnology and genomics, in the last 15 years, there's been tremendous acceleration in the speed of discovery. And it took researchers one day to map the entire genome of the superbug, an antibiotic-resistant bacterium, which is the leading cause of hospital-acquired infection. Just 20 years before, it would have taken years and years of work. Right? So what you see is that in the process of technological innovation, this is not a, um, a straight line. It starts slow. There are lots of people trying to invent something. And then there is a sudden acceleration. We see this trend in many industries. This is modem speed. Before broadband internet, people used modem and dial-in to have access to the network. This is the modem speed in terms of bit per second from the 60s to the 90s. And then you see from the 90s to, to the 2000s how it, how it goes up. So let's think about this S-curve and how it relates to the um, industry life cycle. Here we're trying to model the rate of return to R&D effort. 
in terms of the performance and how does the performance of the product uh, relate to effort or time. And the era of ferment, a lot of effort is going to yield a little improvement in performance. And in the era of takeoff, a little extra effort is going to have great results. And then at maturity level, improvements are self-limiting and performance is often constrained by physical limits. But what you see is that often when you reach that level of maturity, someone else somewhere is inventing the next new wave of technology, which may start at a lower of performance, at a lower level of performance. But then that will catch up and even go beyond. So performance is a nonlinear function of effort expended. In mature industries, more and more effort may lead to less and less progress, while progress in emerging industries may be slow and surprisingly fast. So one lesson from this, as young, ambitious entrepreneurs of the next generation, is to try to spot the next industries and not necessarily to invest into mature industries. So if you think about the industry life cycle as an S-curve, you've got this, this uh, S-curve here, then there is a discontinuity and you have a new one coming up. So for example, thinking about the automotive industry here, yeah. what could be, where do you think we are? Here? 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 What, what do you think? What is your name? Clara? Clara, where do you think we are? Maturity stage. Okay. Do you see signs of perhaps a discontinuity in the automotive industry? Robots? Robotic cars? Perhaps? Right, and that could be applied to to automotive to transportation. Perhaps. Okay. Why not? Why not? Any other idea about the automotive industry? What could be a disruptive innovation? Some people think that the electric vehicles could be that. That we are in this period of climate change, and we need to be very careful about. Uh, the utilization of energy. Some people think that um, we are at the beginning of a real set of innovation on electric cars. Yes? And there are several curves to start. Uh, yes. For example, uh, the next solution may be the new generation, or the third generation, the flying machines. Right. Uh, and uh, the other curve is electric cars. Yes, and exactly. There is no reason to think there would be only one. Absolutely. And if you were to compare today the performance of, say, some electric cars with most normal cars, you would say the performance is not as good, but that is to be expected. Right? This doesn't mean that it may not work. So there are tricky moments for organizations. Difficult transition points will be here between ferment and takeoff, because the capabilities you need as an organization to succeed in this area are creativity, inventiveness, knowing your customers. And then when you go to this phase, maybe you need different capabilities. Maybe you need different capabilities when you get here. What it takes to succeed when you are here may be very different from what it takes to succeed when you are there. And that is an important lesson for entrepreneurs as well as um, individuals who want to work in existing organizations, which is first to try to understand where are we on the industry life cycle? Where, are, where is our product on the S-curve? To then think carefully, what capabilities do we need to have in order to succeed given where we are? Here is an example of technology disruption in the music industry. We start here with a photograph, then vinyl records, then we've got CDs, then we've got MP3. 
That's one graphical way to represent it. This slide, don't worry about the numbers themselves, but what I want to show you is that this is in a, a semiconductor manufacturing industry, it's a particular kind of equipment which is central to the process of making semiconductors, which is called photolithographic alignment. And this study, this was an important study that showed that every time there was an innovation on the design, a fundamental disruptive innovation on those machines. This was one innovation, the contact type machine, this one was the proximity, this one was the scanner, this one for different kind of innovation. Every time what happened is that this was a different firm, these are names of firms, that was the winner. Every time a firm was the winner, in one particular technology, whenever there was a disruptive innovation that arrived, that firm failed in the face of technological change. Even if they had the biggest market share, they had the most resources, they had very advanced R&D, it was as if they were trapped by their own success. So these transitions, Create, uh, are, are dangerous for existing firms, but they also create major opportunities. And some firms have been successful at making the transition from one technology to the next. Corning Glass was a leader in cookware, making those, they, they, they knew a lot about glass and had to make glass utensils that could go into the oven and that could resist extreme temperatures. You could take a Corning Glass utensil from the oven, and then it could even go into your freezer. So they took that capability in terms of glass, and they started to make fiberglass and fiber optics, and they're a leader in that. Hewlett Packard, an American company, started in scientific instruments and moved all the way to computers. IBM started in mainframes, went to personal computers, and goes into services. Eli Lilly, pharmaceutical, started in random drug discovery to genetics and our genomics. So it's not a fatality. Just because you are successful within one given technology doesn't mean you will necessarily fail. Most, fa no, most firms, however, do fail when there is a technological transition. So the strategic challenges evolve than the S-curve. The nature of technical work change. Here the question will be, at the era of Thurman, will it work? What we're trying to build here. There is a lot of exploration, some of it is fun, and creativity is key. When you get to the era of takeoff, the questions are different. Can we make 100,000 of these products? And can we service them? That becomes the focus of the organization. Here, we need to be responsive and flexible, but we need to control our costs. And then there is a big shift again, and we start again. Will it work? Exploration, fun, and creativity. So in terms of technical work, the nature of technical work change over time. From a marketing point of view, the marketing challenge evolves as well. Here the question is, who needs this? Here, do we have any reference customers, big customers that are so well known that that will be the customers that everybody would remember and they give us a good reference and here stay close to your customer and you start again who needs this if we think now about the way in which a firm captures value it also evolved dramatically here speed protection of intellectual property with patents for example differentiation be at the frontier in terms of performance that's key here, in terms of how to capture value, we can sell it, make it, service it, and ship it most of the time. Here, we may not be leading edge, but you'd rather buy from us because we're safe, we have a good service, etc., etc. Then it starts a little bit. The organizational challenge also changed just significantly. Here, it's about entrepreneurial energy. Here, it's about coordination and control. You see, if you look at successful entrepreneurs, sometimes you will see that they are serial entrepreneurs. They start one company, they have a great idea, and then they sell it to a larger firm that's going to make it go to scale. And then those entrepreneurs very often 
they start all over again. Their particular skill is to spot an opportunity that people haven't seen before and start something. It requires different kind of people to manage a large company. If you think about the Google inventors, they are not the one who lead the company today. Successful firms thus need several strategies. A ferment strategy, a takeoff strategy, a, grow, a, a mature strategy, and here a growth strategy. And the effective strategies change over the life cycle. Technology evolves, markets evolve, the nature of competition evolves. Right? There we see there would be much more competition here in a, in a, and competition on price. And here there would be competition between different kinds of designs. And as well as which kind of organization is going to be necessary to be successful. That also evolves. Do you have questions on this particular segment so far? Yes? Uh, what is, uh, what type of competition is necessary on the middle stage? The middle stage here, in the takeoff. Usually, it's, it's very cutthroat competition because there's consolidation going on. So the consolidation makes the, the, the many small players actually die at that area. So the nature of competition here is probably the most intense because what's at stake here is survival. Whereas what you find here is that, at least in principle, there is a lot of competition on price, but what often happens is that at that level, competitors have become very comfortable with each other. And they are almost like a cartel. They almost collude on price. They don't, they are old players who have erected barriers to entry, for example, because they have very um, powerful production plants systems, very established brands, loyal, loyal customers. So the nature of competition is different. Here, usually the driver of competition is going to be economies of scale. Who is capable of scaling it? So to go back here, to go back here. We can sell it, make it, service it, and ship it. Those who don't have the close capabilities are going to be uh, exiting the game. The evolution of markets or predicting the pattern of consumer needs. So now that we've looked at the evolution of the technology, let's look a little bit of what happens from the consumer side once a new technology uh, emerges. The ideas I want to talk about are market segmentation, crossing the chasm, the divide, I will explain to you what that means. And then when you have new markets and new needs, something called the innovator's dilemma, and I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that as well. The question of importance is who, is buy, who buys the technology as it evolves? For example, there is a, a new product that came out, iPad. Okay. Ask yourself the question, who buys an iPad today? Does anyone here have an iPad? Yes? Andre? <laughs> Ask yourself questions. Who do you know has an iPad? And what characteristic, what kind of people are they? Okay. Business people? Okay. Students? Some. some students. So obviously there's a question of means. There's also a question of some people really want to be the first with the technology. They think it looks really cool. They think that it's good. What? It can be comfortable. It, it provides a certain kind of status. They don't mind if it's very expensive now because they really value to be first with the technology. Okay? The fundamental work on uh, diffusion comes from somebody called Rogers, who says we have to understand market dynamics and basic segmentation. If you are making a graph about the number of units bought over time. The first ones are the innovators, the early adopters, then you've got the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. These are the last ones. 
like your grandmother. Yeah, she's probably not gonna buy an iPad. Although you never know. Adopters differ by social or economic status, resources, affinity for risk, knowledge. Do they know how to use an iPad? Complementary assets, they already have the iPod, they already have the iPhone, they want to use the iPad. Interest in the product. Uh, a work by uh, Moore, who wrote this important book called Crossing the Chasm, said that it's between the early adopters and the early majority that is a very difficult divide for companies to cross. From a marketing perspective, making the transition from early adopters to early majority users often requires the development of quite different competencies, servicing, support capabilities, and much more extensive training. So it requires the professionalization of the firm to be able to go from a small but loyal group of aficionados who are going to launch on the product, even if it's got some bugs but it doesn't bother them, to an early majority who wants more comfort and to be able to you know, press the button and the thing. And many studies have demonstrated that this is a very tricky decision, a very tricky um, divide. I want to talk now about so-called disruptive technologies. Do you remember what PDAs are? Personal Digital Assistant, right? So what was the, the PDA that was the most successful? Do you remember that? The palm, the palm pilot. Do you remember the palm pilot? So, yes, exactly, exactly. So the PCs were there, and then we started to have PDAs. Okay. Initially, the PDAs did not seem to be a threat to PCs. You have to think about PDAs sold to customers with different needs. PCs had a lot of speed, power, and memory, but in terms of weight, much lighter, in terms of cost, PDAs were better. So at first, it looked like PCs didn't have much to worry from PDAs. They were not competition. They were a different niche, a different market, for different needs, and different users. However, as PDAs' capabilities expanded, and they became really almost like computers they became more of a competition to PCs. Sometimes you have consumer preferences that may change. So what may happen when you have initially two different technologies, either the capabilities of this technology augment, so that's the supply side, or the demand characteristics also evolve. Let, let me just wait a minute. Then what happened to PDA? Who has a palm pilot today? Nobody. Nobody, right? They got eaten up by smartphones. Smartphones, the powerful cell phones, started to be everything that the PDA was plus a phone. So the whole category of PDAs disappeared. So this is an example to tell you about a bit more about those so-called disruptive technologies that may threaten establishment. Here we've got a curve explaining the performance of a technology over time, how it evolves over time. And this is from a very good book from Clay Christensen, who is a professor at Harvard Business School. The book is called The Innovator's Dilemma. I strongly recommend reading it. He's looked at a variety of industries, and he found a similar pattern. You've got an established technology which over time, you know, increases its performance. It increases its performance, but at the same time what happens is that there is a new technology coming up, which at first does not look at all threatening, because it's just not very good. So usually the mainstream suppliers don't worry about it. However, this technology has an interest, which is usually much, much cheaper. So what happens is that, at first, this technology reaches 
of niche customer. But then as more investors start to invest in this technology, it becomes greater and greater, and it even goes and supersedes the performance of the second technology. And that patterns happen a lot. So for example, if you think about Intel microprocessors, they were doing faster and faster microprocessors, and then they started to realize that there was a, a niche market for simple microprocessors, which they call the Celeron microprocessors. At first, there was a lot of opposition within Intel to even invest in those, because they thought, we, Intel, should be only about the most powerful microprocessors, not the less powerful but they realized that this was going to be a disruptive technology and there was going to be a whole new market for tablet consumer laptops that would require less powerful microprocessors, but there would be a great amount of demand for them. So that's an example of a disruptive technology. Can you think about examples of disruptive technologies yourself? Netbooks, that's one. So today we have some cameras here that are filming the session, right? And there are a small number of students in the class today, and probably a larger number looking at their computer on the blog to have the experience, although it's probably not as good, sorry. <laughs> than for those who are here. That may be a disruptive technology for the way of education of tomorrow. Possibly. Let's now focus on the question of how shall we capture value. And we're going to talk about the concept of uniqueness, complementary assets, and the structure of the value chain. Think about the industry in terms of we're going to have the inventor, imitators, followers, suppliers, and customers. Ask yourself what determines the inventor's share. Under which condition will the inventor get more share or less share? What would be the reasons why an inventor would be able to capture more value or less value? What kind of ideas come to your mind? Do you have any ideas? Right. So how easy would it be to imitate the product? So if it's very easy to imitate the product, what would you predict would happen to the inventor's share? It will grow smaller. Yeah? So you want to make it difficult for others to imitate. So one way to make it hard would be to protect it with intellectual property regulation. For example, patents. So is this the, idea? Is this the case that great ideas equal pots of money? If we look at history, we realize that not always. RC Cola, which is a firm that you never heard of, are the one who invented the Diet Cola. Who made money out of Diet Cola? Coke and Pepsi. Yeah? Xerox invented, invented uh, the graphical user interface that Apple made a lot of money out of. Um, but some companies are able to invent here for Dell, it was processes and automation in the processes of making computers. They were able to capture a lot of value. So let's try to understand what makes the difference between these companies. Two ideas. Uniqueness. Can you control the knowledge generated by an innovation? That is, can you make it hard to imitate? And another aspect is, independently of your product itself, can we make money even we are not unique? Control the assets that maximize the profits from innovation. So for example, that could be a brand that people associate with the product. That could be a distribution network that you control. And that's very hard for others to imitate. For example, if you're in the automotive industry, it's very hard for a new entrant, an automotive maker, to set up a whole national network of car dealerships. These are usually long contracts or franchisees who have exclusivity contracts. And developing that whole new network of um, 
of, um, of distribution is going to be time consuming and extremely expensive. So that can act as a so called barrier to entry. Complementary assets are either available for anybody who wants them to grab, and you can buy them on the market, or they are tightly held, such as the distribution network or these brands that I'm talking about. And uniqueness is either easy to maintain or hard to maintain. So to profit from innovation, you want to be in a place where you have tightly held complementary assets, as well as unique. But in some cases, you don't necessarily have tightly held complementary assets. Okay? So for example, in the computer industry, you have a lot of standards. Right? Things are compatible with each other. So a firm does not own a firm that makes, say, a microprocessor or an operating system. They don't make all the different pieces of the value chain. But sometimes they can still make money because they are unique and they are a bottleneck within that supply chain. You can buy all the other pieces with lots of different competitors, but this particular piece you're going to have to buy from Google or from Microsoft. When you are in the era of ferment, it's extremely important to be unique. But this is also now the time where you have to start developing your complementary assets. So imagine you have a great idea and a great innovation. Immediately you have to think, not just about let's prove to the world that it's a great idea, which is what innovators and entrepreneurs usually focus about. You also have to think, how do I start building today complementary assets that will make it easier for me to capture the value from this innovation, even as competitors are going to start imitating. So this is now the time to start investing into developing the brand, developing your network of distribution, uh, controlling some key suppliers, so that as you grow, you grow your complementary assets, which are going to erect barriers for new entrants to come in and compete with you. Managing discontinuities means managing these complementary assets. You need to think about which of my assets are helpful at this stage or at this stage. And will they still be helpful at this stage? Sometimes the complementary assets that you have, which are extremely helpful here, may actually hurt you here. Let me give you an example. In the United Kingdom, you might have heard of a company called Marks & Spencer. Do you know about Marks and Spencer? It's a very large um, chain of stores that started over 100 years ago. And originally that started by doing clothing. And one of their key complementary assets was their network of clothes manufacturers all over England. But in particular, in the region of England, in the Manchester area, where they had a big competence in textile making. And over decades, almost 100 years, Marks and Spencer developed their relationship with those textile makers all over England. And they started to also have an advertising campaign which lasted for many, many years about how MS, Marks and Spencer, was a British firm that dealt with British uh, manufacturers of clothing, which struck a patriotic chord in the UK and people like them. So their tight links with their network of UK-based uh, suppliers was a great complementary asset. Fast forward to the 1990s, and you start to have very strong competition coming from Asia, Southeast Asia, or Turkey, or other places in the world where they start to do pretty decent quality at a fraction of the cost. And with the lowering of the cost of transportation and lowering of tariffs between different international trade, all of a sudden, what used to be a great asset for M&S, their tight long-term relationship with UK-based suppliers, 
turned into a liability precisely because people associated them with UK all the time. They felt they couldn't disentangle themselves from their relationship with these suppliers. But these suppliers now were too expensive to compete with the H&M and Mango and Zara who had a very, very uh, uh, much less expensive cost base. Okay? So what I'm telling you here is that what can be a resource as a complementary asset here can turn against you. Right? Why M&S was able to get such good costs from their UK suppliers is because they were so big that a UK supplier would sell 100% of its production to m and So they could get, they had a lot of bargaining power over those suppliers. But then they couldn't explicate this. So it took them many years to change their relationship to their existing supplier. We are still in the topic of capturing value from innovation. And I want to think about, together with you, the question of bargaining power in the value chain. So I was mentioning to you earlier what is a value chain. And I want to give you a graphical example. Imagine that we are looking at the production of paper. How do you make paper? What do you start with as, as raw ingredient to make paper? You start with the best trees. Trees? Sorry? Yes. You start with the forest. You've got to start with the forest. So. Imagine you've got a forest here. Some people are going to cut the trees. Not very good at drawing. Right? We're going to cut the trees. Then we're going to cut them into slots. Then you're going to make them into some sort of powder and add a lot of chemicals to it. So that's going to be in some sort of plant. And then you're going to have sheets of paper. Okay, it's a simplified description of that process. Okay. This whole chain of activities is sometimes called a supply chain or a value chain. When you use the word value chain, you're thinking about mostly how value gets created, and you think about the supply chain, it refers to the same thing, but you think about the different ac actors who are going to get involved into these different activities. Logistics. Logistics can be part of it, definitely. So here, you're going to distribute, for example, the paper to different stores. Here, you're going to have to organize the logistics of trucks that are going to transport the, the wood into different plants. So logistics is definitely part of it. Sorry? Distribution as well. Excellent. That's all part of it. So in a traditional supply chain, the input, the input factor that is being used inside a particular stage of the process is being processed and then it comes at an output. Okay? So if we think about these different actors, sometimes it's different firms that each make one stage of the value chain. Sometimes it's one company that owns the whole set of activities. Okay? So when it's one company that owns the whole set of activities, economists use the word vertically integrated companies. So if you see the word vertically integrated company, it's a company that is present and active at all stages of the value chain. Otherwise, it's a fragmented industry structure. So remember that graph I presented about the, what determines the share of each of the players. So you have to think in terms of bargaining power between the different actors involved at the different stage of the value chain. Some um, actors are more powerful than others. And we're going to have to understand why. 
powerful to determine the price at which the transaction will happen or the quality of the product that they want to buy. Okay? So imagine that we are talking about a value chain where you have one company here that has a particular patent on the process technology on how to make paper. When they have a patent, that means nobody else can imitate that particular process. But imagine that here there are lots of different companies that have access to different forests and they can provide timber. If this company here has a patent that gives it some monopoly on, a, on, a, on an essential part of that value chain that will give them a lot of bargaining power over the other stages of the value chain. Okay? So that's what I want to explain to you a little more. Even if these different firms are interdependent, not all of them are as powerful as each other. There is no equality in the degree of bargaining. There is a very important framework on capturing value that comes from Michael Porter, who is uh, probably the most famous strategy professor in the world, who teaches also at Harvard Business School, and he called this the Porter's Five Forces. It's about thinking about the balance of power between a firm and its suppliers and its buyers, whether there is a lot of rivalry in the industry, whether there is a lot of threats from new entrants, and whether there are lots of substitutes. Okay? So, the Porter's five forces, sometimes people say you actually need seven forces. You need also to think about the political, regulatory, and institutional context. How easy is it, for example, to make patent law um, respected or not? How corrupted is a business environment or not? How easy is it to have access to capital if you are an entrepreneur? As well as another force, which is developers of complement, complementary products or complementary services. So imagine you have uh, a piece of software that, that uh, you're developing that is compatible to Windows. Maybe it will not be compatible to Mac. So you have to think about if you're Windows or if you're Apple, how are you going to encourage developers to develop for your operating system? So that's a relationship of complementarity. So the Porter Spy forces remind us to think about the structure of the value chain. And if you think about what is a key determinant of the share of the value that a firm gets, is you think about the supply chain that they are a part of. Think about who their suppliers are as well as who their customers are. If you are in a company and in an industry where you need to get some supply and that there is a lot of rivalry amongst your suppliers, is that going to be good for you or bad for you? You want to buy some input from suppliers and then you go towards your suppliers, and there are lots of them. And they're in strong competition between each other. Do you think that's going to give you bargaining power over them or not? It's good for you. Exactly. You will be able to let competition take care of itself, and you will be able to benefit from the competition at the supplier's level. If, on the other hand, you are dependent upon the input of one particular supplier, and they have a monopoly on this, they can ask you for a very high price and therefore you are going to be in the lower position of bargaining power. What happens here between you and your suppliers also exists between you and your buyers. Remember the example I gave you about Marks and Spencer? They had some suppliers, many suppliers as a matter of fact, for which they were the only buyer. They would say, okay, you are my Manchester supplier of wax, white textile cotton. I said to you, I'm going to buy 100% of your whole output. You think, fantastic, I don't have to worry about anything. I only have one client and, you know, I sell them everything. Now, the problem is, next year I come back and I say, I'm going to buy 100% of your output, but you're going to have to lower your price 20%. You're going to have to make it decision. So that puts you in a position where you cannot say no to me, because if you say no, you lose your only client. Okay, so here is a situation where 
your buyer, I'm your buyer, I'm your customer. I have a lot of bargaining power over you. Okay. In some industries, you see that the buyers organize themselves as coalitions to gain more bargaining power. For example, in the tourism industry, you have a lot of tour operators that buy in bulk places in hotel, hotel nights, or um, uh, plane tickets. They buy a large number of plane tickets, and because they are buying in bulk, they have more bargaining power than one individual. Okay? So we have to think in terms of not just where are we in the S-curve in terms of technological evolution, but also where are we in terms of the supply chain. Who are our um, suppliers? Who are our buyers? And do they have bargaining power over us, or is it the other way around? Now, if you're not happy with the state of bargaining power that you are in, you can try to change it somehow. For example, if you are dependent upon a supplier whom you're not happy with, some companies start to make investment to start competing with their own supplier. That is, they're going to start to make that, that uh, product or technology in-house. Or they're going to try to find a substitute. So some people call that vertical integration. So they're going to vertically integrate into the market of their supplier. That's one way to go about it. There are others. OK? So that was an introduction about what we've done since the beginning of the lecture until now, an introduction about the evolution of technology and markets, diffusion of technology, and power in the supply. Now I want to move on a, on, a, on a different topic, which is about creating new market space. And for this, I want to ask you to watch a video, okay, which is going to last 10 minutes. And I'm going to ask you to think when you are watching this video. Uh, this is a video about the performance of Cirque du Soleil. Have you ever heard about the Cirque du Soleil? Yes? Who has seen a performance of Cirque du Soleil? Yeah. Very good. So Cirque du Soleil actually started in 2009 in Russia. Um, uh, this is still a young company. I think they're about 15 years old, maximum. And they've had 80 million uh, viewers, 80 million consumers so far. They've been a tremendous success. And um, they are called Cirque du Soleil. So it's a kind of a circus, although it's a bit different than a traditional circus. And what I want you to think about when you're going to watch the video is in what way what you're seeing is similar to a traditional circus performance, but in what way is it also different from a traditional circus performance? Okay? So, I'm going to ask the gentleman there to put the video on. Okay? Can we um, lower the light as well?
che bella la musica!
but I want to give you some competitive context. Feld Entertainment Incorporation is the largest circus company in the United States. And these are figures of their revenue from 95 to 2001. You see it's stable. This in yellow is the re annual revenue of Cirque du Soleil, which started very little in 95 and 2001 was practically the same and it continued to grow. So if we try to organize the factors um, from the traditional circus offering that the Cirque du Soleil eliminate completely, maintain, or enhance or increase. So let's try to organize this list of factors into groups. What did they completely get rid of? What did they keep? And what did they actually increase? Before we go into that, I want to show you something else. They, are create, they have created several shows, which each have a name and a style. They started first with one, the Salty Minko. Then they did another one, called Allegria. And then they realized that they could actually play several of them at the same time, in different locations. But the basic elements that they needed to make the shows were the same. You still have some acrobatics. You have some clowns, you have some dancing, you have some different elements. You put different makeup on, but you can take these modular elements as basic building blocks for every kind of performance. But you add a different musical theme, a different decor, a different storyline. So they have multiple production and they keep adding more. So what have they, what have they, um, yes, this is, this is an expression, I, I call that the value curve. If you compare the big league circus and the little league circus, the big league circus are the big traditional circuses. They have a high level of diversity of emotions and acts, humor and fun, danger and thrill, a choice between three rings aisle concessions, which means you have those vendors who come in the aisles and sell you peanuts and cotton candy and chocolates during the performance. Animal shows. And they have star performers. Nobody noticed that, but they don't have star performers. That is, you don't have a master of ceremony that is going to come and say, and now the famous, I don't know, Karamazov brothers <laughs> who are going to make their fantastic world-known um, act. You know, the performers here are not named, never. What happens in terms of their own bargaining power of the, of the employees if they are not named? They cannot access to a star status. If you start to be named, you, know, you have this famous performer who comes here. Next thing you know, the performer goes to the director and asks for a raise. I'm becoming very important to your show and I'm being courted by a competitor. If you keep them nameless, you keep their bargaining power pretty low. Another thing that Cirque du Soleil did is it hired uh, international crews coming from China, but also Russia, where there is a tradition of acrobatics, and there is a lot of supply of those people who are talented into these acrobatics. So it was also able to pay them not very much, at least when they started. And by not giving them access to a star status, it keeps them, um, it keeps a bargaining power over them. Now, Cirque du Soleil, which I present here, has a kept emotions and, and um, diversity of emotions and acts, humor and fun, danger and thrill. It didn't let people choose between three rings. It didn't do idle concession. Got rid of animal show. Got rid of star performers. But it priced higher. And it added some things. The unifying theme, a more refined watching environment, multiple production, and the individualized music and dance. And then I'd like to bounce on something you were saying about theatrical performance. If you ask yourself, where did this idea come from? Where have we seen these things before? 
Well, yes. It comes from opera or theater. In opera or theater, you had a theme and a story, an individualized music and dance, multiple production, and refined watching environment. So what they have done, really, is to combine the, some elements from a different industry altogether, which was still in show business, but was not the circus, kept some element from a traditional circus, and got rid of some elements here. These addition of these elements allowed them to push the prices higher. Getting rid of these elements allowed them to push their costs down. And they kept some elements from the surface. So it's an innovation here by combining different ideas from different industries. They challenged some assumptions of the industry. It used to be three rings. They did one ring, star performers, non-star performers. It used to be seasonal. This was throughout the year. One show, multiple productions, mostly for children, mostly for adults. Animals, no animals. Unrelated acts, just a master of ceremony, introducing them one by one. Here it is a story and a theme. No music or dance, individualized music and dance, a low price, a high price, high push for concession sales around the aisle. Here mostly profit from tickets, emphasis on fun and thrills here, the emphasis on artistry, functional watching environment, a more refined watching environment. Okay. So here I want to use this example of Cirque du Soleil to make us all think about how can you create new market space in the industry that you want to be a, a participant. And traditionally, people only think in terms of, what can I add? This is the offering that my competitors are doing. Maybe I can add more feature to it, add more factor, make it more, make it better. And the example here of Cirque du Soleil makes us think, actually, sometimes you may want to add something, but also you may want to reduce something or get rid of something altogether. Think about what factors should you eliminate that the industry has taken for granted. Then what factors should be reduced well below the existing industry standard. At the same time, also think what factors should be raised well beyond the industry standard, and what factors should be created that the industry has never offered. For example, if you think about the furniture industry, uh, I'm sure IKEA is in Russia, right? IKEA is in Russia. So when IKEA started, they had this idea of putting out of city centers those large stores where you would go and pick up your furniture. Right? But you'd have to assemble it yourself, take it home and assemble it yourself. When they started to do that, it was quite a shock to the industry because previously, if you wanted to buy a piece of furniture, you would go to a furniture store you know, say you want to furnish your new apartment because you just got married. You go to the furniture store, you choose a sofa, you choose a bed, you pay for it, and they say in three to six weeks you're going to have it at home. And it came with that saying, obviously, that they would install it for you. The idea that putting together the piece of furniture has to be done by the client was unheard of. But if you think about what IKEA did, they eliminated this service, which was furniture comes assembled, and they shifted that work onto the consumer. So they eliminated a factor. By doing that, they were able to reduce dramatically the price of their furniture and access a very large market that previously could not really buy new furniture. So sometimes new business models come from eliminating factors, or sometimes reducing them. At the same time, you have to raise factor well beyond industry standard and create some factors. So what you have to think about strategically, about what factors do you raise versus what factors do you decrease, think about the impact it will have on your profits. What you want to get rid of are the expensive activities that may actually not be fundamental and necessary. And it sometimes requires challenging the assumption, the conventional logic of the industry that everybody takes for granted. Precisely because it's taken for granted, that means that there is room for innovation. And that's what, for example, Cirque du Soleil did. 
with, by creating this new value curve. Another area where we can see that a company created a new market space is in the airline industry. You all know about low-cost airlines. Right? So in Western Europe, we have EasyJet. I don't know if it exists here. No. In, uh, no? Are there low-cost airlines here in Russia? Uh, yes, skyscrapers. OK. So if you think about EasyJet value curve, which is EasyJet is a very low-cost airline. So you can fly from London to Italy or Germany or from Paris to the south of France for the price of a bus ticket, the price of a much cheaper than a plane used to cost. And they've been extremely successful, EasyJet as well as Ryanair. They have tapped into a new market of people who didn't used to consider taking the plane for these distances because it was too expensive. But they got rid of some stuff. For example, they got rid of business class. If you want to buy a business class ticket on EasyJet, you simply can't. Because there's just one car, which is all economy. They also got rid of onboard service. They will not even give you a glass of water for free. You have to pay for everything. They don't have a worldwide network, which is different from traditional flag carriers. They don't offer you a frequent flyer loyalty program. Um, if you miss your flight, they don't give you a refund. And the location of airport is much less convenient usually because you have to go to airports that are outside the center of town. But they've kept the safety of the planes, well-trained pilots and usually new planes. They're very punctual. And they've added a few things, which is you don't have to buy a return ticket. You can just buy a one-way ticket. And you don't have to stay for Saturday night to get a cheaper, a cheaper plane. So this is an example here of a company that got rid of some stuff, kept some stuff, and added some stuff. But they were able to be extremely successful. For example, they redesigned the inside of the plane. And by getting rid of first class, they added much more seats in the plane where the whole first class was. Because in first class, as you know, there are fewer seats, but more spaces between seats, and the seats are wider. Here, everybody is scrunched up like sardines, but you put more people on the plane. So that's one way to represent all the different activities that EasyJet did. They offer limited passenger service. And you may think, but wait a minute, the other business models of the other uh, airline companies, they make all their money on first class. If you get rid of, of first or business class, where are you going to make the money? Well, they're getting rid of first class because the people who want to work for easy, who want to fly EasyJet are not the people interested in first class anyway. So they are, they are not looking at the same population. They are extending into a different kind of population. So they are offering limited passenger service with no meals, no baggage transfer because they don't offer transfer. They don't even give you a seat assignment. You get to the airport and you're online. And at some point they say, okay, you can charge, you can now go on the plane. And everybody runs on the tarmac, which is... <laughs> kind of funny. Um, they don't offer um, um, hubs with transfer, but it's always point-to-point -point routes from A to B and B to A. But because they don't offer these transfers, the planes only stay 20 minutes at the gate, which means that the planes are up in the air almost 11 hours per day as opposed to 6 hours per day. In a traditional, um, in a traditional um, airline network, I'm getting, I don't have enough paper. Can I, can I? I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> in, a, in a traditional airline, you have a... Um, networks with planes coming from A, B, C, and then they're going to go to D, E, and F. This is a hub. And here you've got planes that are waiting for plane A, from A, from B, from C to arrive so that they can fill up the plane. So built in the network means they're going to have waiting time at the gates. 
EasyJet, on the other hand, only does these kinds of trips. So the planes never wait, and they have many more, um, many more hours in the air. If you think about the economics of the airlines, the more hours in the air the plane is, the more you have paying passengers per mile. And that's the basic unit of profitability in the airline industry. So they utilize their aircraft a lot. They load it very much with lots of people. They have reliable and frequent departure. They've also made some choices about having a standardized fleet of Boeing. One fleet means they have lower maintenance cost and lower training cost. They don't have to maintain fleets with different technicians of maintenance. They only do direct sales. <coughs> you can't buy EasyJet from a travel agent. You have to buy it on the internet. So they don't pay the commission of the travel agent, which is 8 to 9%. And they have a very lean corporate structure. So all these elements together form a network of activities that are coherent. And that made it very difficult for traditional established firms to try to imitate the business model. BA, British Airlines, tried to imitate the business model and even created a subsidiary called Go that said, all right, we're going to do the same. And then they realized that people were getting upset because they were not uh, offering frequent flyers on Go. Everybody knew Go was part of British Airways. Why couldn't you get miles from British Airways? The pilots didn't want to, to work the hours of uh, Go because it was more beneficial for them to work the old hours of British Airways. British Airways also was established in the airport that were more central and therefore they had no incentive to go to secondary airports but those first airports were very congested. So what we see is that when a company has a particular business model and a whole organization that is optimized to that particular business model, it's very hard for them to transfer and switch to a different business. So I want to give you now a few examples about how to create new market space in a way that is a bit similar to what Cirque du Soleil did. But first of all, do you have questions about the Cirque du Soleil example? Yes? What are three rings? So the three rings, in America, the big circuses, they have three different types of uh, stages. And, that, and, and you had three rings then. So you had multiple shows running at the same time. So if you want to create new market space, it's helpful to think about shifting the focus of strategy and the conventional boundaries of competition. Try not to be constrained by competing within your own industry and create value across different industries. For example, if you think about Cirque du Soleil, we saw that they created value by mixing value across opera and theater and cir the circus. Thank you. Uh, another example would be in Japan, NTT Docomo iMode. Do you know about this iMode? Do you, have you ever heard about this service? It was the first mobile internet service on mobile phone in Japan. And for many Japanese people, it was their first way to access the internet. It was before even the internet was so widespread on, on computers. Thank you. So what happened here is that they were mixing the value created by mobile telephony and value created by a traditional PC internet offering. with this I mode, which was way to access now what most of us have, which is internet access on, on the cellular phone. But they were the first ones to do it. So the value offered by mobile telephony was mobility, quality of voice, ease of use. Um, and the value created by the PC internet was email, games, and fun, checking news. And I mode was trying to, com to, to combine this. Now, you can also try to create value by shifting the focus from competing within strategic groups to creating value across strategic groups. The strategic group, if you think about, do you know what segmentation of market means? You've got different market segments, like for luxury cars and medium cars and family cars. 
So the strategic groups are the supply side of that. That is, firms that specialize into serving particular segments of the market. In most industries, the fundamental strategic differences among players are captured by a small number of clusters called strategic groups. Most companies focus on improving their competitive position within a strategic group. So say you are a luxury car maker, you're competing with luxury car makers. Or if you're a family car maker, you focus within that particular group. And you compete with people who are like you. But the key in creating new market space is to understand what factors determine buyers' decision to switch from one strategic group to another. For example, there is this clothing fashion brand called Polo from Ralph Lauren. They succeeded by offering both what customers value in haute couture as well as in classical lines. I will show you an example of that. Haute couture, very high price, very trendy designs, the name of the designer is very important, the luxuriousness, and the craftsmanship. Classic lines are more cheap, less trendy of everything, less designer name, less luxuriousness and craftsmanship. Polo, what it did is it kept the designer name, the luxuriousness and the craftsmanship, but it got away from trendy design. It offers very classic lines. So it attracted the population of people who had the means and the money to buy it those luxurious goods, but did not want to look like too trendy, catwalk type fashion. And so it created a bundle, a hybrid of an offering between what used to be distinct strategic groups. Another way to break the usual boundaries are to think within the buyer groups. Look across the chain of buyers. In most industries, Competitors converge on the definition of the target customer. The customer is usually a lot of direct or indirect customers, which are the purchasers or the users or the influencer who will difference value. Challenging one, definition, one industry's conventional wisdom about which is the buyer group to target can lead to the discovery of new market space. For example, Bloomberg focused on the trader and the analyst, not the IT managers. It used to be the case that in the financial industry, um, Reuters, which was uh, providing analytics, uh, did not try to sell to traders or analysts within investment banks, but to the IT managers. Bloomberg thought the users in this industry are the traders and the analysts, and they didn't used to be the one making an influence on the purchasing decision. Bloomberg added some features to its system that were of use to the analysts. Quicker calculation, quicker analytics, as well as an ability to do online shopping on the system, and started to lobby, and, and, the, and the analysts themselves started to lobby the IT managers to buy. Philip Lighting focused on the CFO, the chief financial officer, and the public relations officers, not on corporate publishing, purchasing. Entity Docomo created the win win situation with content providers. So sometimes you, you have a group of buyers which is distinct from the group of users. And the industry tends to focus on one group and not on the other group. So there's value into thinking uh, outside the box. That's uh, more on the example of Bloomberg. The online financial information industry used to have high price coverage of price quote coverage of news, but not easy to use. Bloomberg offered a much easier to use terminal online analytics, another feature which was helpful to traders such as historical price data and lifestyle information. One other area which is very helpful if you want to think about creating value is to think beyond the scope of the product and the service offering. Let me give you an example. Of that. Few products or services are used in a vacuum. In most cases, other products and services affect their value. Think about what happens before, during, and after the offering is used. Companies can create new market space by focusing on the complements. It's a very important point. That detract from the value of their own product or service. For example, there is a company that is a chain of cinemas in Belgium called Kinepolis. They have helped people get babysitters. You have babysitters on site. And huge uh, car parking facilities right next to the, to the cinema. That allowed the whole population of people, you know, parents of young families, to go to the cinema much more easily. So they were not thinking about making just 
more comfortable cinema room, but services before and after that complements the service. Dyson vacuum cleaners created the bag less clean. So you don't have to go and worry about buying new bags every time. Borders, which is um, a well-known chain of, of, um, of bookstores in the United States, and Barnes & Noble, a similar industry, they offer a comfortable reading experience and intellectual exploration. You have lounges there and you can sit down. It looks like a, a sitting room and you can go and you can read your books right there in the bookstore. You don't have to stand to start to read your book. And that created a whole new uh, demand for the product. Another example of combining, uh, combining offerings is this filter line kettle from Philip, which is a combination of a traditional electric kettle with a filtering system. So it both filters the water and boils it at the same time. This is what happened here in Border, Borders and Barnes and Noble. You used to have the independent bookstore that gave you more ambience and a better selection of books and more knowledgeable staff than a normal bookstore. But Barnes and Noble added to this and as well the cafe and the lounge area. Another point about if you want to create new market space is about thinking about your product in a, in a, in a, in a spectrum of Functional on the one hand and emotional on the other hand. If you think about every product you can or service, you can spot it on the, on the spectrum of is it an emotional purchase or is it a more functional purchase. So traditionally, if you want to buy, for example, a um, computer, it would be much more of a functional type of decision making. How many megahertz, how many pixels on the, uh, 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 on the screen, uh, how long is the battery life? Very measurable, rational kind of categories. Uh, more recently, it's become much more of an emotional thing. Are you an Apple kind of person? Or, or are you going to be... And Windows is appealing now to, you know, I'm a Windows person, as if it's a kind of an identity. Looking across functional and emotional appeal, competition converges around two bases of appeal. Rational, based on the trade-off between price and function, or emotional, based on feelings. Industries tend to train customers in what to expect. Companies find new market space when they are willing to challenge the functional emotional orientation of their industry. For example, the Swatch budget airlines turned budget watches into fashion accessories, so it became a more emotional purchase. On the other hand, body shops stripped away the emotional appeal of the cosmetic industry. Do you have the body shop here in Russia? Yeah. Yes. So the body shop. Um, if you think about how they distinguish themselves from more traditional cosmetic industry, um, it takes away some of the phony scientific promises. If you look at, for example, anti wrinkle cream from most traditional cosmetic companies, if you look at the commercials, you're going to see some man in a white coat showing you that they've done a scientific study over hundreds of women, and they're going to show you a computerized version of uh, how much the wrinkle cream, uh, the wrinkle is going to get lowered after six weeks, and it's going to sound very scientific. Uh, something else that they do is they invest a lot into the packaging, and uh, beautiful uh, crystal or glass bottles, and you pay a lot for that. And you, they're usually going to hire very um, well-known movie stars to promote that. The body shop doesn't play with those rules. It doesn't make promises about giving you uh, beauty and beautiful uh, boxes, but what it does is it sells product in a very cheap conditioning. They are much less expensive, but it appeals on a different kind of emotion. It says it's not tested on animals, and it uses um, it uses recipes from traditional cultures. So it 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 is both more functional in terms of it doesn't try to sell on the basis of the beauty of the box or of the bottle. But on the other hand, it appeals to a different kind of emotion. Okay. Now, when you look at commercials, think about, is it more of a functional appeal or more of an emotional appeal? One of the most expensive watches around is a Patek Philippe watch. Patek Philippe is a very, very, very expensive watch from Switzerland. If you look at the commercial that they have now, it always involves a father and a son or a mother and a daughter. And it says, you're not... Buying a pat you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You are holding it as an heirloom for the next generation. So that's pretty emotional sale. 
to tell you, okay, it may cost you hundreds of, th of thousands of whatever currency you're in, but it brings in an emotional element about this is going to be your heirloom for your children. Okay? They're not trying to tell you it's a precise watch or you're going to have the exact time. It's, it's a much more emotional appeal. So sometimes a way to create value as well as to capture value is to think about switching away from the traditional way of selling in that industry. This is um, the example for Swatch. The mechanical watches used to have high prestige, durability, not very good on multifunctionality, and uh, not particularly trendy design. Japan made digital were lots of multifunctionalities, uh, quite durable with a low price, and Swatch kept some of those elements but was much more uh, trendy as well as uh, very inexpensive. So you, the idea is you can have many swatches to fit, your, to fit your mood or to fit your outfits. And is the body shop a traditional cosmetic company? Well, the cosmetics industry had high price, uh, high level of packaging and advertising, high-tech cosmetics, so-called science and the glamorous image. The body shop mostly got rid of all these things but added natural ingredients and representation of healthy living and the idea of a more ethical kind of company. The last point I want to make in this uh, section of the, of the course is think about trends that affect our society over time. Large social trends that affect us. If you look across time and trends, all industries are subject to external trends that affect their business over time. For example, now you're going to say climate change is a big trend, or uh, worrying about sustainability is a big trend, uh, thinking about the evolution of an aging population is a big trend, thinking about the effect of globalization is a big trend, big social trend. Firms tend to pace their own thinking to keep up with the development of the trends they are tracking. Um, by finding insight into trends that are observable today, firms can unlock innovation that create new market space. These trends must meet three conditions. They may be decisive to your business, irreversible, and have a clear trajectory. Then ask, what would the market look like if the trend was taken to its logical conclusion? CNN saw the power of television deregulation, emerging satellite technology, and appetite for global news. Cisco saw the growing demand for high-speed data exchange potential, exploding demand for switching devices. What are sort of trends that you see around you that you think are changing or have started to change the business landscape. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Web services. Cloud services. Yes. Yes. That's right. So putting all the applications and all your data onto the cloud. So let's think about that. What, how is that going to affect consumption and what kind of markets do you think will be created because of this? Cloud services. Yes, very true, very true. It also starts to create a lot of concern about security, computer security. Uh, concerned about privacy of information, uh, secure personalized data, that's going to be also a big business riding on this cloud. Right? So sometimes you have a cloud, you have a, you have a trend, and it creates also some concerns because of that. So that's one example. Another example, maybe? In food, for example, there is a lot of concern about the health-related health issue of food. Organic food, uh, Food that doesn't deplete the resources of the earth so much, that doesn't require so much um, chemical additive and pesticides, as well as issues about contamination. That's also a big trend. So there will probably be uh, businesses that will be created around both the desire to have <coughs> more sustainable agriculture, as well as reassuring the public on the safety of, 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 the, of the food that we ingest, right? Uh, organic food shops can be... Uh, they haven't? Uh, no, organic food shops. No? Yes. 
Yes, you do. Well, it, ten years ago in continental Europe, people were saying, "Well, it's never going to take off," but now it's taking off in a, in a tremendous way. So, uh, I think it will probably come in all areas of the world, and there will be there will be trends that will start here and not just start in Western Europe or in the United States and then come to Russia. There will be trends that will start here and then they will go to other parts of the world. For example, if you think about China, there, there is a lot of thinking about eco-cities developing. I mean, China is, is faced with a population of a huge influx of people coming from the countryside to go towards urban areas. Millions and millions of people gravitating around uh, cities. And they've had an unprecedented rate of, of building, which also created lots of problems in terms of, you know, as you have here, congestion about uh, automotive, and uh, in general, uh, a lot of weight on the um, on the public infrastructure. So this is the, the countries and the regions that are facing those problems that are going to come up with the solutions, which then will be diffused throughout the world. And I, I'm sure Russia here has a lot of of uh, role to play. So a summary slide about those ideas. Uh, if you want to create some new value and pursue what we can call value innovation, you can think about those factors. What factors should be reduced well below industry standard? What factors should be created that the industry has never offered? What factors should be raised? And what factors should be eliminated? That's the way to create a new value curve. And the next thing we looked at is look across industries, across strategic groups, across the chain of buyers, across complementary offerings, across functional or emotional appeal, and across time and trend. So I, I have a few more slides I want to show you, because I didn't know how long it would take you, or take us, to go through this. Uh, so this is a temporary conclusion about what we have covered today, and then I'm going to show you some more slides about digital platforms. So what we've covered so far is how to take advantage and avoid the pitfalls of technological innovation, to explain the interaction between technological change, market dynamics, competition, and the evolution of demand. We've talked about how to create and value and capture value, how technological change affects market. We, look, we looked at the industry life cycle, how to profit from innovation, and how to create new market space. So we can take a five minutes break now if you have some questions, and I'm going to load up the, the other slide that I have about a new kind of innovation that I see is very important, which has to do with so-called platforms, technological platforms and digital platforms. Okay? Platforms exist when you have a complex technological system, such as the computers, or the internet, or telecommunications, or electronic payment, media, and consumer electronics. These are complex systems made of different pieces, often made by different firms. But they also exist in transport, in retailing, in energy, and in biology. These industries share common features. Fast evolution of the technology, they require the collaboration between many firms, and it's very important for products to be interoperable and to work together. But successful business models differ, and you see different industry structures. What is an industry platform? It's an essential component of a larger system. It's linked functionally to several components of the system, and it allows, that's probably the most important part, third parties, that means external firms, to develop complementary products or services with possibly a multiplicity of use, in addition and in collaboration with your own firm. Let me give you
there is this logo, and if you click from that website, which is not owned by Facebook, onto the Facebook account, you can make a directly a link from your Facebook page to the content of that website. So you see that Facebook is connected to other sources of data and information through you. So that's an example of that. Another example of that would be Google. Google, if anyone knows, is the market leader, world leader in search engines. And it also is a platform on which there are lots of different applications that are compatible with Google. Google Maps, uh, uh, Google Docs, uh, what other applications? Google Calendar, uh, pictures as well with Google. Now, the iPhone. And I would say the iPhone together with iTunes is a platform as well. How many apps are developed for the iPhone today? More than 10. Apps? Not users, apps. apps. More than 10 million. Or more than a million. Yeah, the last time I checked it was 180,000. So <laughs> So there are lots and lots of apps, but I didn't, there are, and all these apps, maybe now we're reaching the million, all these apps are making the iPhone more attractive. The developers of these apps do not work for Apple, and Apple doesn't pay them any money, but they develop a complementary service or an application that makes the iPhone more attractive. Similarly, the content on iTunes is not developed by Apple, it's content developed by artists, and, and iTunes is a distribution platform, which then allows lots of content to developers to access millions and millions of users. So these are the digital platforms of the Windows is also a platform, the thousands of people Can you hear me better? So um, you have lots and lots of applications that are compatible to Windows, and that together makes the platform of Windows more attractive. Now I have three little boys at home, and sometimes I trip on some Lego blocks inside my house. And looking at those Lego blocks, I thought they have some features that actually make them look like platforms. They are standardized building blocks. You can. Um, you can uh, find some similarities among all the Lego blocks, which is they have those interfaces, those little plots here, that are all the same size, and that allow blocks to be put securely on top of each other. Securely enough that a structure is going to stand, but not so difficult to disassemble that you cannot disassemble them. And with some basic commonalities in the structure of those blocks, but some variation as well, about the length of the block, as well as the color. You can build all sorts of things. This is here a Lego, a Lego artist that built a whole city out of those Lego blocks. So the Lego block is more like a metaphor of a simple building block on top of which you can develop systems with different kinds of use. The reason why it's important to think about platforms today so those technological building blocks that can be technology, products or services that act as a foundation on top of which an array of firms organized in a set of interdependent firms, sometimes called the industry ecosystem, who develop a set of interrelated products, technology or services. We live today in a world where software is a technology which is everywhere. And lots of people can develop digital software type applications that can build on top of those platforms. But we see platforms not just in digital. Platform dynamics have appeared in many industries. As I think I mentioned that before. They are not very well understood yet. They have appeared in many industries, and when they emerge, they usually change, they alter the industry competitive and innovation dynamics. Some giants, such as IBM, got toppled over by newer firms like Microsoft and Intel. What, what, what we can also see is that there is a lot of innovation happening in business ecosystems. Because it's not just the one firm that owns the technology that can innovate, but lots of other firms, and they can even be independent developers, that can innovate on top of the platform. They don't have to reinvent the whole system. They can contribute to it and take advantage of it. They also 
benefit from network effects, which means that the more people use the platform, the more the more the platform becomes attractive to users. The more it becomes attractive to users, the more it becomes attractive to developers who want to develop for this particular platform. So it is a cycle, a reinforcing cycle, that fuels growth, and that makes it very hard for new entrants to dislodge those existing platforms. This acceleration of competition here and this erection of barriers to entry is what explains that some of those platforms we've talked about have become so dominant in such a quick time. Facebook today has close to 600 million users. And nobody knew about Facebook just six, seven years ago. Uh, Google has also had a, a tremendously accelerated growth to the point that today it is Microsoft which is knocking at the door of the European Commission to ask them to launch an antitrust lawsuit against Google because of Google's dominance. Now, coming from Microsoft, it's an interesting story. So the tremendous uh, power of those platforms comes from the fact that as other developers can build onto these platforms and the install base provokes this momentum of growth, it also erects the barriers to entry from others to compete with these different platforms. The emergence of platforms transforms industry. This is an example of the evolution of the computer industry, coming from a, group, uh, a book from Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel Corporation. In the early 1980s, you had competition between computer makers, IBM, DEC, which was digital, and WANG. They used to be what we call vertical integrated. I used that word before. That is, they made all the different pieces of the computer in-house. They made it themselves microprocessors, operating system, middleware, application software, they made it all inside. And if you as a consumer were hesitating between buying an IBM computer or a DEC or one, if you opened up the box of the computer, you would see different pieces that would be linked together completely differently, whether you would buy an IBM versus a DEC versus a one. The same way that if you, you, know, you buy a car today and you are looking at the way a Volvo car is built compared to a Renault car, it's a different architecture design. Fast forward 15 years, mid-1990s, what you see here is that this industry got fragmented. Some people say horizontalized or modularized. And what you see is the emergence of those specialist makers, makers of microprocessors like Intel, Motorola, AMD, and Cyrix, developers of operating systems, Microsoft, the Apple, Linux, middleware, Sun, Oracle, Siebel, application software, Microsoft again, SAP, and others. And these specialists made the different layers. Okay? They were the one who captured most profit in this industry. Even if they had not invented the architecture of the computer, they started their life as suppliers to IBM, in particular Intel and Microsoft. But they were able to innovate so much on their own piece, as well as the interface between these layers became standard, which invited competition from other people on, the, on those layers, that the bargaining power uh, went away from the system assemblers, who were here, to the component makers. Okay? Now, I'd like you to think about the automotive industry. What does the automotive industry structure look like today? A nature of competition. Are we here or are we here? We are here. Yeah? We are here, right? It is very much in the interest of the existing players to keep it here. Right? They want they do a lot of advertising campaign to show you that, you know, if you buy BMW, it's a very emotional experience thinking about the value innovation. It's a very emotional experience which is very different from driving a Skoda, for example, or a Nissan Micro. Right? Now, I just came back from China where I was giving a talk at the, the World uh, Expo, Shanghai Expo, and there are lots of interesting development in China and in Asia that want to do an open architecture of cars. They want to do to the, com to the automotive industry the same thing that happened to the, co to, the, to the computer industry. They want to create an open architecture for cars, um, and there is a coalition called AutoSAR that is trying to do to publicize open connection and architectures for cars. And you have um, Chinese component 
engine makers as well as European engine makers such as Bosch and Siemens who are very much in favor of that because Bosch and Siemens want to be the Intel and the Microsoft of the automotive industry. So what you see here is that the structure of the industry is not static forever if you have um, and it's thinking about power in the supply chain, like I was talking before about uh, porous five forces. If you have some component makers or suppliers that would like to take power away from the assembly. So that's an interesting development. Here is a, a slide again from the computer industry where you see that they use the word platform, flexible platforms, which are um, chassis and architectures that say for categories of cars, sports utilities are going to look like this, compact multipurpose are going to look like that, family hatchback are going to look like this, and they are going to reuse a lot of elements uh, within these families to have different models. And so the architecture that I was talking about is trying to standardize all those components and how the way they are uh, re um, connected to each other. Platforms emergence affects industry dynamics, positions of industry leadership get challenged, the structure of the industry changes, away from tightly controlled supply chains to loose coalitions of complementors, the nature of competition itself may change, away from system-based competition towards component-based competition, and instead of having competition between firms, the way we used to see, we're starting to have competitions between coalitions of firms. They're not necessarily part of the same chain, they don't necessarily buy or sell from each other, but they are contributing collectively to creating an evolving system of technology. The nature of innovation changes as well. It focuses innovation on trajectories of complements, and there are new strategic opportunities that arrive, which I call platform leadership, to exploit the benefits of open innovation and tapping into innovative capabilities of external firms and individuals. There are lots of platform battlegrounds today in web search, Google versus Bing and Yahoo, in smartphone operating system, in digital media, in social media, in video games. And within video games, you see now more, a lot of videos um, being created for mobile phones as well, which is a new platform for video games. Enterprise software, micropayment and there is a new platform on payment using your mobile phone as well which is quite popular in Japan so you sort of swish your mo uh, mo mobile phone in front of a reader and the transaction happens right there and then and I've been doing some work with participants of this industry which would very much like this industry to take off mobile payment contactless mobile payment with your mobile phone and the thing is it is such a complex ecosystem re uh, involving banks payment scheme like Visa and MasterCard, but also mobile phone makers, operating systems, and network operators, that they're having a very hard time agreeing on what the business model is, and who should capture how much value, and who's going to own the data of the consumer. And there are lots of other systems. So that's just an introduction that I wanted to give you before we go, because we are now finished, on um, you know a panorama on innovation and the economic and business challenges of innovation as well as not just creating and capturing value, but sort of the next wave of innovation, which I think is very much about this platform.